Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 18, verses 1 to 2, and then verses 19 through 29. It's our unison reading. Uh, Before we read together, let us turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, we do give you thanks for the gift of your word, and we pray and know as we come before you that we come with many things on our hearts and minds, and we ask that you would Help us give you attention this morning that we may receive your word again this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. So Psalm 118 verses 1 to 2 and then verses 19 through 29. So let us read together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? So let us read the opening account of this Palm Sunday from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Follow along as I read. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of the Lord. So how do we curb the violence in our nation? How do we address and push back against the systemic violence in our nation and in our cities? How do we address and resolve the pain and frustration and distrust and disillusionment with our leaders and the friction caused by unjust laws and racism and religious intolerance? That's what the people in the streets of Jerusalem are crying out. 2,000 years ago. 
when Jesus came riding into town on a donkey. Both the Romans and the Jews in Jerusalem that day assumed what they knew what Jesus promised to bring the kingdom of God meant. And Jewish delegates with their clubs and daggers ready to storm the palace, ready to spill Roman blood and take their roles in this new kingdom of David. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were anxious to retain their leadership offices. And the centurions were ready to use force to ensure that Roman law and order stood in place no matter what the cost. Jesus had been preaching that the promise, the kingdom of God was coming near and the crowd swelled on that march to Jerusalem and they assumed he, they knew what he meant. They were eager to make sure that their expectations in this new covenant were met and that their party stayed in power. Hosanna, they shouted, save us. And preacher Paul Rock says that that parade was not just a parade, it was a street demonstration. It was a political rally that easily could have become a riot and the crowd was buzzing with tension and with energy the factions were at odds with each other. The rumors were rampant. And Jesus rode his donkey down the street to the face of the Roman forces that were occupying Jerusalem with their wealth and with their weapons and with their martial law. And Jesus rode into the midst of the revolutionists with their clubs and daggers and pitchforks at hand. He rode right into the middle of that demonstration. And did not join ranks with any of the parties. He rode in the middle of that demonstration, and he certainly didn't join ranks with the zealots with their daggers, and he certainly didn't side with the religious leaders, nor with the Romans. He confronted the assumptions inherent in their expectations, and he presented a different view of the kingdom a different definition of power. Because the Romans assume, were assuming that Jesus was going to stir up the revolution and the people in the streets assumed Jesus was going to affirm God's covenant with Israel by establishing a new king. But Jesus did neither. He introduced another way, a, a deeper covenant with God and his people that found its strength in simplicity and its wealth in generosity and its leadership through service and its power through sacrifice for the good of others and its unity and love for one another. So again, to quote Paul Rock, no one's blood runs in the streets that except Jesus' blood. And radicals and Roman Republicans alike are challenged and transformed. Jesus brings a revolution of grace and justice and forgiveness and hope. He brought a, a, a paradigm shift. He brought a new perspective in God's kingdom and covenant. Perspective means a lot. My high school art teacher, Mr. Arthur, taught us the, the principles of linear perspective. Large forms look closer to the viewer than smaller forms that seem far distant in the picture. When parallel lines converge on the horizon in the distance, like railroad tracks coming together, or, or highways coming together, where they meet at the point of perspective on the horizon, all of your principles start to follow suit and it gives order and depth to the picture. Move the vanishing point left or right on the horizon, it changes the perspective of your picture. If you move the horizon up or move the horizon down, it changes the whole perspective of the view of your picture, your painting, your photograph. He could look at your drawing, Mr. Arthur could, and, and he could put a blob of paint in the middle of something on your canvas, and then with a few brush strokes and a little shading, boom, a building appeared. 
or a rock formation or a tree or a trellis. And it gave height and depth and perspective to your picture and added dimension front and rear. A whole dimension change in your painting, your drawing. Palm Sunday adds a perspective point. And it adds perspective to Jesus' ministry and his mission in coming to Jerusalem. And Mark's gospel in particular adds some details that the others don't. As, as they're approaching Jerusalem, Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead to the nearing village where he says, as you go in the village, you'll find a, a colt tied there, a colt that's never been ridden. How, how does he know that? How does anybody else know this colt's not been ridden? And if anyone asks you, why are you, doing, why are you taking this colt? Just say to them, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back to you immediately. And the two disciples went ahead. They found it just as he said. They were untying the colt. Somebody asked, why are you doing this? The Lord has need of it. He'll send it back to you immediately. And they said, okay. And they let them finish their task. So let's add a little perspective to that. Though Matthew, Mark, and Luke suggest that Jesus has not been to Jerusalem prior to this. John's gospel says that Jesus visited Jerusalem regularly and went up for the great religious festival. So this was not the first time he's been to the city. All four gospels tell of his friendship with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, who lived in Bethany, the little village outside Jerusalem, which suggests they must have had several visits together to establish a friendship. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Jesus in Jerusalem. How did he know him if he had not been there? And Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 37, that often he would have gathered the people of Israel together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but they were unwilling. How can he say that unless he had previously made appeals to the people of Jerusalem and they wouldn't respond? Apparently, he had made prior arrangements with the owner of the cult. Jesus sent his disciples ahead with a, with a password. Had this been prearranged? The Lord has need of it. Oh, okay. This was not a sudden last-minute decision. Either Jesus had foreknowledge in God's divine will, what was awaiting and what needs to be said, or had he arranged these things because Jesus had been preparing to come to Jerusalem for quite a while? In Luke's Gospel 19, verse 51, he said he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to stop him from his appointed purpose there. Was this part of the arrangements and the plan when he got there? Mark's Gospel is the only one that includes the promised return of the donkey. And he says, and he'll return it to you immediately. Immediately follows through Mark's gospel, throughout the gospel. Track how many times the word immediately appears, and it's always after Jesus speaks or makes a pronouncement to show the power of God to do things. He spoke, and immediately the man was healed. It's, it's as if he says, and when we're done, we'll bring the cult back immediately, right after the parade, right after we're done. Matthew, Luke, and John don't describe it that way. Because it says, only Mark's gospel has that he went to the Jerusalem and went to the temple and looked around at everything, taking it all in. Matthew, Luke, and John say he got there and a different thing occurs in Matthew's gospel. He enters the temple and drives out the money changers. The, the sellers, the merchants, overturns their tables and then leaves. Luke says he looks at the city and weeps over it. Bill, you're exactly right. Where are you, Bill? <laughs> he looks and he weeps knowing what they face and what's going to happen to them. He weeps over the city and then enters the temple and drives out the money changers. John's gospel doesn't include him entering the temple. Instead, he says he comes to Jerusalem and he focuses on the teaching, Jesus teaching about the grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die in order for life to come. He's foreshadowing his sacrificial death. So this detail Mark adds. After the parade was over and all the shouting was over, 
he enters the temple and looks around at everything. as if taking it all in. And then he leaves and goes out to Bethany. Mark uses the word immediately, I said, throughout his gospel, but not here. It almost suggests that Jesus just slows down, taking it all in, what's happening in Jerusalem, what's happening in the temple, sizing up his opposition, knowing what he's about to face this week and everything is ready and he's gearing himself up to accomplish what he came to do. It's as if he's recommitting to his mission to be there, knowing what's about to happen to him. Looking around, sizing it up, gaining strength to endure what's coming. That detail of his looking around shifts the perspective of an otherwise glorious day of parades and and praise for the Messiah. And one writer said the Palm Sunday is not just about the donkey or the ride or the palms or the hosannas. It's about the passion of Christ, the suffering that is to come. And of him looking around and taking it all in and leaving nothing behind him as he carries us and everyone else forth and to suffer what awaits him. We too face big moments, hard moments in our lives, hard decisions, hard circumstances, life-changing moments when we do well too to slow down, consider what's going on. What are we getting into? What have we created for ourselves? Are we ready for the challenges? Do I have all that it asks of me? Do I have what it takes? Is is this what I want? Am I prepared? Can I see it through to the end? Have I turned to God and asked for what I need to do what I must do and to face what I must face? And then this other little detail, a perspective point. As it was already late, he left to go with the 12 to Bethany. What was late? Was it just late in the day and they needed to do their travel to the village before sundown? Was it late in God's plan and I've got to now go do what I'm called to do? For what was Jesus late? So in an interesting twist, or maybe a detail, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that the colt was borrowed from its owner, but only Mark records the promise to return the colt. Was Jesus honoring his vow, his covenant, to return the colt before he went back to Bethany? He could have sent the colt back by his disciples, and he may have, But what if Jesus wished to see the donkey's owner personally on his way back? To return his colt, thank you for your part in the plan, thank you for helping me with this, and and I seek your prayers now, my friend, because we know what's coming. Maybe he left the temple to honor his promise to the owner of the colt. Maybe to honor his promise to God. Maybe Jesus had us in mind as he leaves to go do God's will. And so how like Jesus to stay true to himself and to honor his promises. True to his mission on our behalf, despite what this week holds for him, he was willing to do it for us. So to put a perspective point, do you and I honor our promises? To God, to one another, even to ourselves. And when we face the challenges that those bring, do we seek out the prayers and support of a trusted friend? Are we as wise as Jesus? Maybe he was going to see the owner to say, would you pray for me now? Maybe. 
at the temple, Jesus took time to look around at the temple and everything that was happening and all the people there and what they were experiencing to prepare himself for Holy Week. Maybe we need to slow down from time to time and take things in. Take a good look at your situation. Look at our worldly situation. Know that Jesus is entering the mix for us because he wants to be with you because he loves you. And he's promised to be with you in all things and never to forsake you or to leave you. He's counted the cost, and he's ready to die that week. That he might be raised that week for you. And deliver you into goodness and in peace. He is honoring God's covenant be with you and to deliver you. But this is not what the crowds expected waving their palm branches and celebrating the arrival of their promised king. He was the hero Messiah who's come to smash the Roman order. They thought he was there for a showdown against the Roman officials. And this is what they wanted. This is what they needed. This is what they were hoping for. They were asking Jesus to throw off their Roman oppressors and restore the throne of David to its legitimate rule over Israel and to do it now. And here he came on a donkey one of the promises of the Messiah coming, but it's a symbol of humility, not a military horse, the symbol of conquest. And he approached Jerusalem as a humble servant, not as the majestic king, a warrior king. And the people were so obsessed with preserving their party's political and economic power, they were blind to what was taking place in front of them. God was at work but not in a way they could yet comprehend. God is still at work in us. Sometimes we can't see it. And sometimes to see him, we have to really stop and look around and take it all in. Not a stretch, but a difference, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, one of the great movie producers of all time, movie makers, was the master of suspense, and he had a quirk that endeared him to his fans. He made cameo appearances in 40 of his 54 films. In The Birds, he appears just saying, you see him winding a clock. In Dial M for Murder, you see him walking a dog, just for a second as he goes by. In other movies, he's boarding a bus. Another, he's crossing in front of a building in the background. He's standing in a courtyard of the apartment across the way. And in one scene, he appears in a newspaper photograph as somebody's looking at something. Just for a glimpse, you get to see him. And that was his quirk, and his fans loved it, and he loved playing the game to see if you can find me in the movie. If you look closely, you can spot him. But you have to look. Sometimes you really have to look to see God at work in your life, but he's there. And when you sense God in your life, it shifts everything. Sometimes it's wide open, sometimes it's a hidden view, a little detail, but it changes everything. It changes the perspective point on the horizon. And to go back to that image of an artist painting a picture, Brian Waldrop writes about watching an artist who seems to have completed a picture, and then he cringed when the artist added a dark blob of paint to the painting. But as he watched with a few brush strokes and adding a few other little colors, the artist continued to add texture and color, and it took shape. And when that part was finished, the part of the picture that Brian Waldrop thought was looked ruined, it was a great. It was exactly what it needed to bring to completion. And he says, it wasn't a stretch till I thought as I watched that artist's work. That, that sometimes I, I cringe at the many moves the artist made in his brush. I sometimes think this is critical of my Christian life because many times in struggling and hardship, I've come to the place where I'm comfortable and I'm just basking, thinking this is great, this is great, this is great, and then God has chosen to institute a change that I neither expected nor wanted. 
And that's when I want to say, no, Lord, you're, you're ruining the whole picture. Don't change things. But as I allowed God to continue to work on the canvas, to my surprise, my life began to look pretty good. And then it was exactly as it needed to be. And that's when I remember to thank God. Both for the addition and the subtractions in my life. But then he says, there have been times, however, that the change never looked good to me, and perhaps never will. And during those times, I have to remember, God is still painting. The picture is not yet complete. And I have to travel on in faith, knowing that when I finally see him face to face, my painting is going to be beautiful just as it needed to be. In the meantime, I take comfort in knowing that in every situation, though it may be ugly and bad, it's the paint that the master can use for good. God sometimes works when you're not aware of it. The crowds that first Sunday were looking for something other than what they had got. They wanted a conquering king, and Jesus appreciated their high hopes. He knew what they were hoping for, but he knew that these hopes were short-sighted because he had a plan that's going to change the world forever. He's not going to smash the oppressive government in Jerusalem. He has come to begin building a new world order. And he starts with a small group of men and women who share the faith, and then it grows person by person by person until it transcends all the governments of this world. And that little band of Christian followers now numbers in the millions, and they are building hospitals and building schools and serving meals and helping the people caught in oppression. They are building, healing the wounded and working for justice. They are battling racism and sexism and all the other isms of injustice. They are bringing people out of darkness into light and giving them hope and courage for the world to come. And that's why we are shouting even this day, Hosanna, praising God, for he is leading us toward that day when oppression will be no more. And everyone lives in dignity and has shown respect and giving honor, and we live together in peace under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the master plan. That is the perspective that is changing completely. And if he could honor and use a simple donkey and make it useful in his kingdom work, he can use me, he can use you. He can use your talents and abilities too. Can he count on you? Thanks be to God. God, it's all that easy, but it's all that hard, for the challenges are so great. But you are greater. Thank you, O God, through Christ our Lord. Amen.